Hello everybody, myself Seema Gupta. Today I will give you the general overview of the titrimetric analysis. Titrimetric analysis, for origin of titrimetric analysis, we can date back around middle of the 18th century when it progressed along with the industrial development. In fact, it was Gay Lussac who in 1835 devised volumetric method for the first time and the term titration originated. Before we take up this term, titrimetric analysis, let us try to relate it in a broader sense to the rest of the branches of chemistry. Analytical chemistry is a branch of chemistry which employs to all the experimental sciences. This branch guides us to develop and apply new methods and techniques to verify or identify the nature and composition of matter. This is the basis of chemical analysis which is an art of recognizing different substances and determining their constituents. Chemical an analysis involves various technologies, develops procedures, provides tools and makes use of variety of instruments and finally the interpretation of the results is obtained. So whenever chemical processes are employed, whether simple or we use any, uh, any problem like analysis of elements and the compounds derived from them using a different kind of chemical reactions, use of alternative methods of analysis or the development of high profile instruments. The chemical analysis is indispensable. It enables, it enables us to answer a few questions like what is happening in a chemical reaction? What will the course of reaction same every time and everywhere? What are the quantities of the reagents required? So all these problems are discussed under the main branch of chemical analysis. Now various methods can be used to know the nature and then how much or the exact amount of the, con the confirmed constituents. So basically chemical analysis we can divide into two categories. One which we say concerns with the nature of matter and the other with the composition of matter. In the nature of matter matter, we want to know what are the various constituents in it, what are the elements, what are the ions in it. And when we say composition, we want to know how much each quantity it is. So basically we can say it is the answer to the two questions, what is it, qualitative analysis, and how much is it, is the quantitative analysis. Now, as the word quantitative analysis indicates, we are concerned with the quantities. We have in general been using two methods we involve in this, gravimetric analysis and the volumetric analysis. In gravimetric analysis, the substance which we want to determine, which we call analyte, is allowed to react with a suitable reagent with which it will form an insoluble compound. We say precipitate it and then it is converted into a weighable form and then this form is dried and weighed. Now after collecting this, the weight of the compound which we obtain after the various operations, we relate it to the starting that is analyte and providing we have the stoichiometry equation with us, we are able to know what is the weight of the compound and what is the original strength of the solution we have started with. So, but it is very important for us to know what are the formulas of the compound. It should be correctly known. Now, then we come to the volumetric analysis. Volumetric analysis. So, we are talking about volumes. It is concerned with the measurement of the volumes. So, it is, again we can say of two kinds. One in which we are talking measurement of volume in a solution. And when we are concerned with the solution, we give a better term. In fact, the term we specifically use for this is the titrimetric analysis. While volumetric analysis can also involve the term when we say measuring the changes in the volumes of the gases, how much gases are being 
evolved or being absorbed in a chemical reaction, that is also kind of a volumetric. But when it is linked to the solutions, we better use titrimetric analysis. Titrimetric analysis in which a substance which has to be determined, analyzed, we add once again a suitable reagent, but this time we are titrating this the reagent with the analyte. And the volume of the reagent now consumed for the complete reaction can be known from the stoch can be known from the stoichiometric and this concentration is then calculated from that reacting ratio or otherwise which we know. So once again stoichiometry of the equation has to be known and then we can calculate what is the original concentration with which we started depending upon how much it has reacted in the titrimetric analysis. So volumetric analysis once I again say is concerned with volume, volumes but titrimetric is a better term which we use. Let us try to define few of the terms which we will keep on using when we start with the titrimetric analysis. The most commonly in titrimetric analysis we use titrant and titrant. Titrant, the reagent of known concentration is called titrant and the solution being titrated is called titrant. Now in general in titrimetric analysis the volume of the titrant is added with the special uh, kind of a device. It's a long tube which is being uh, put, a, which is being equipped with the stop cork at the end, which is which which can control the delivery of the solution. And the titrant is being flowing through this stop cork where we can control its flow, and it is used to add into the titrant. So titration, we, as we say, the process of determining analyte by adding small increments of standard solution until the reaction is just complete and the reacting ratio of the two being known from the stoichiometry or otherwise. Now if like we have a substance A and B, we are going to determine the concentration of A we start adding A into B, but we must know from the stoichiometry that B and A, if this is the exact amount of B, then how much will be the A in the reacting ratio? So whatever volume of B has been consumed now in this complete reaction, which can be shown by any of the method, we will talk later on it in terms of the end point, we can evaluate or determine the concentration of the A substance. So the point I said in a titration at which the amount of titrant added is chemically equivalent to the amount of the substance titrated. That is the point at which the completion of the reaction occurs is called equivalence point or stoichiometric endpoint. Now the point at which the completion of reaction is practically observed is called endpoint. The point of a titration at which some property of the solution, for example the color shows a pronounced change corresponding more or less closely to the equivalence point is called the endpoint. So this endpoint may be represented by the intersection of two lines or curves in the graphical method at the or the two points, end point and the equivalence point should coincide practically, but that doesn't happen. End point is in general a little ahead of the equivalence point. Now the, complete, the completion of the titration is accompanied by some physical change in the reaction mixture which can be identified visually or with the help of the instrumental techniques. When I say visual change, it is a color change in general we talk about. The color change can be seen with the titrant itself. Like the titrant itself when the reaction is complete undergoes a change in the color. That means titrant where there is no need for any external agent to show the color. But in case the titrant is not able to give the color, we use the external agents like we call them indicators 
indicators we use as a reagent which will give a pronounced change during the reaction when it is over. Then if we are not, uh, we can, uh, not dependent upon the visual change, like without the help of the indicators, the pronounced change can be checked with the instrumental techniques, like change in the physical properties. Change in the physical properties can be conductance, can pH, EMF, absorbs, absorbance or shift in the absorption maxima. Any of these we can use for the change and the endpoint can be detected. Now let us see what a suitable chemical reaction we can select which can turn out for a successful titration because all the time we have been talking about that stoichiometry of the reaction should be known. We should be knowing that how much A is going to react with the B so that we are able to detect them. And when we have such constraint with us, then that means every chemical reaction cannot be put into the titration. We must have some selection criteria and that we are going to discuss. First is that the reaction should be simple and well defined. That is the stoichiometric of the reaction should be known. We must know that how much changes or number of moles will be changing but the reacting ratio of the two. Then the reaction should be complete at the equivalence point. It should not be leading to different kind of products being formed or any kind of side chains. If it is complete at the equivalence point, only then we are able to detect the end point. It should be fast. The process here should be fast so that it is easily detectable and then for endpoints, there has to be a change in some property of the solution when the reaction is complete so that we are able to say now the reaction is complete, this is this much volume of the one of the substance we have to add into the other one. Now, so what are the conditions for designing a successful titration? Titrant should be standard or it can be standardized. A stable, well-defined, detectable equivalence point then volume or mass of the titrant and analyte must be accurately known. And then endpoint should not be far balance point. It means that, that you have thought the reaction has ended. By the time the endpoint is being detected, the equivalence point where actually the two reactants have reacted to each other is being gone by. So that should not happen. Now we are talking about again and again standard solution, standard solution. That means out of two of the uh, analyte and reagent, one we should have a standard solution. So a standard solution whom we call? We call a solution of known concentration to be a standard solution. Now, can any solid make the standard solution? No. Depending upon the chemicals being used, we can term them as primary standard or as a secondary standard. Which will be the primary standard substance? A compound of sufficient purity from which standard solution can be prepared by direct weighing. That means if we take the quantity, we dissolve it in definite uh, quantity of a solvent, we make the solution. Now this we know that we have taken a standard amount, we have dissolved in the standard uh, solvent. Now this is our primary standard solution. So starting from a primary standard substance, we have to make a primary standard solution. Now what are the criteria which we feel that every substance cannot be a primary standard? We are here again to talk about a few conditions which we impose that which solid can act as a primary standard pure compound or capable of being analyzed for impurities by known reactions. It should be stable, unaltered by air composition, by uh, the effects of air. That means it should not get deliquescent, it should not get oxidized during storage. And then it should have a high relative molecular mass because if the molecular mass is low and you are going to make very dilute solutions, then it will be very difficult to weigh that much of amount and there will be more of the errors being involved in the analysis. 
so all the solids in general we prefer that they should be having high relative molecular mass and then of course they should be readily soluble in the solvent and then the reaction should be stoichiometric and instantaneous so coming to the primary standard solution we said a solution prepared from the primary standard solute or substance whose concentration is known from the weight of the substance in a known volume of the solution then the secondary standard if primary is direct weighing secondary will be the one which we have already made a reference to the primary one like we now are not able to make the solution or the substance is not able to fulfill all the conditions which we have discussed for the primary substance then we are left with the method that if we have to use this then this first have to be standardized with reference to some primary standard and now we know its strength then it becomes the secondary standard substance and the solution made from such kind of substance we call it the secondary standard solution which has been prepared from a known weight of the secondary standard substance but has been standardized with reference to the primary standard so what is standardization the process of finding the concentration or the reacting strength of a solution by titrating with a known amount of the substance which is pure or has a reaction value what is titer the reacting strength of a standard solution usually expressed as a weight of titrated substance equivalent to 1 ml of the standard solution is the titer value one should not get it confused with how much of the volume of the titrant you have used it has nothing to do with that it is the weight of the titrated substance equivalent to 1 ml of the standard solution now we are going to talk about concentration units which we will use because in any case we are going to talk about the strengths we are going to talk about the strength in terms of concentrations we use the two terms in regular molarity and normality when we talk about the titrimetric analysis molarity molarity is defined as number of moles of solute dissolved per liter of the solution we can abbreviate it as capital m so number of moles will be molarity into number of liters you have made the solution but since we in general when we do this exercise in the class we are concerned with a small scale uh, very little quantities are encountered in the titration instead of liters we use ml so when we restrict ourselves to um, ml we call for from moles we come to millimoles and millimoles is molarity into ml so this is about molarity when we calculate in terms of molarity see the reaction it is ma a analyte suppose and t titrant giving a product now you can see here this reaction is in 1 is to 1 ratio so when it is a 1 is to 1 ratio then that means for number of m moles of a it is equal to number of m moles of t so molarity of a into volume of a is equal to molarity of t into volume of t in ml so m a v a is equal to m t v t this is true when the reaction is 1 is to 1 ratio but in case we have different ratio when it is not 1 is to 1 we say uh, a moles of a analyte and t moles of say titrant now this gives the product so that means for every millimole of a it is approximately equal to a by t millimoles of t right so now molarity of a and volume of a will be equal to molarity of t into volume of t but now also we have to give with respect to a by t it is into a by t so t m a v a is equal to a m t v t we are we say t is the number of millimoles of titrant in balanced chemical equation and a is the number of millimoles of analyte in the balanced chemical equation these are the relations which we, when we use the concept of molarity but in case we come to the concept of normality normality of a solution is equal to number of equivalents of the substance per liter of the solution that means 
Normality now is in terms of the equivalence. It is abbreviated as N, capital N, and it, when we talk about again ML, small quantity, we say M equivalence divided by ML. So, M milli equivalence will be equal to normality into ML. Number of equivalence. The number of equivalence of will depend on the number of reacting units which will be supplied by uh, each molecule or the number with which it will react. Uh, this is very important for you to remember. For example, I take one mole of HCl. Now, one mole of HCl, it will produce one mole of H plus. So, its normality will be one number of reacting unit one, normality one. I take one mole of H2SO4. One mole of H2SO4, it will give two moles of H plus. So, number of reacting units will be two. So, this is how we talk about what is the number of the reacting part being supplied by the substance. That is the number of equivalent. The number of equivalent so can be calculated from number of moles. Equivalent is equal to moles into number of reacting units per molecule. So, when we talk about normality, we have to talk about equivalent weight. Equivalent weight of a substance is the weight that will furnish one mole of the reacting unit. Like just now we talked about that one mole of HCl will furnish one mole of H plus. So, the equivalent weight of HCl will be molecular weight divided by 1. And equivalent weight of H2SO4 will be molecular weight divided by 2. So, number of equivalent, once again we say weight of the substance divided by equivalent weight of the substance, that becomes gram per equivalent and normality is equal to number of equivalents per liter. Taking again the two, weight of the substance in grams divided by equivalent weight of the substance in gram equivalents per liter is our normality. Now, what is the relation between the normality and molarity? Not to get confused, I said equivalent is equal to number of mole into number of reacting units per molecule. So, equivalent per liter, we are dividing it, uh, the both sides by L. So, equivalent per liter is equal to mole by L into number of same reacting units per molecule. So, normality is equal to molarity into N. What is N now? N is the same number of reacting units per molecule or its stoichiometric factor. Now, equivalent weight and molecular weight. So, since we talked about normality and molarity, let us talk about equivalent weight and the molecular weight. Equivalent weight of the substance, gram per equivalent is equal to molecular weight divided by N. So, molecular weight divided by N will be the equivalent weight. So, the earlier equation which we used TMAVA is equal to AMTVT where it was not 1 is to 1. So, we now can write it as NAVA is equal to NTVT. So, that means if we just put the stoichiometric coefficient the, for the equation which we are using for the molarity, we can all altogether say that this is the same as we talked in terms of the normality. So, there is not much difference or there is no confusion. The only thing is we have to talk about the stoichiometric coefficient when we talk about the molarity and in normality we have already taken this into, cons into consideration since we said number of the reacting units. So, this part has to be clear. Now, let us see what are the various steps when we start with any of the titration. In general, when we talk about titration, we make primary standard solution because as we said, the primary standard is needed. Titrant also sometimes you have to prepare or it can be provided to you. But the titrant has to be standardized. So, the third step is the titrant will be standardized. Then, if once the titrant has been standardized, analyte will be titrated with that titrant solution and then whatever the observation, the data you collect, you will analyze their data. So, how the volumetric calculations will be done? They are very simple and they are based on the law of equivalence. Now, the law of equivalence states that at the end point or equivalence point, the number of equivalence of the substance titrated is equal to the number of equivalence of the titrating reagent used. So, Again, we are coming, but they are in the equivalence. So, 
if V1 ML of the solution 1 of the normality N1 requires V2 ML of the solution 2 of the normality 2 for the reaction completion which we said will be indicated by the end point then number of gram equivalents in V1 ML solution will be N1 into V1 by 1000 and in solution 2 will be N2 into V2 by 1000. So, this is N1 into V1 by 1000 and 2 into V2 by 1000. Same thing which we talked about that uh, normality it is per liter. In gram equivalent per liter N1 V1 is equal to N2 V2 will come out when we are using this law of equivalence. So, this normality formula is the key relation in all the volumetric calculations. And when you are going to calculate the normality of any unknown solution, unknown normality, unknown solution means whose concentration we don't know. That is that we always call unknown whose concentration is not known and you are going to calculate it. So, unknown normality is equal to volume of solution of no normality and its normality, uh, volume into normality and then divide it by the volume of the solution of unknown normality used for reacting completely with the second solution and from once the normality is known you multiply it with the equivalent weight it will give you a strength. If you look, calculate the molarity like you talked about normality you use A1 M1 V1 is equal to A2 M2 V2 molarity equation you have used and now you want to calculate the strength you multiply it with the molecular weight no difference at all. Normality concept multiply with the equivalent weight, molarity concept multiply with the molecular weight. Now, let me tell you that in the titrimetric analysis, we can uh, in general categorize this titration into various categories or different types. Like one is the neutralization titration, neutralization titration, and then complexation, precipitation, and redox neutralization titration. The word neutralization immediately it comes to the mind it has to be uh, linked with the acid and base. So, a titration involving the transfer of protons. Now, this we can again say acidimetric or the alkalimetric. Acidimetric when a base is titrated with the standard solution of the acid it becomes acidimetric. Alkalimetric when an acid is titrated with the standard solution of the alkali and it will be alkali. So, standard solution acid, asymmetry, standard solution alkali, it becomes a alkalimetry. Complex, complex session reactions. Here, the titrant, it forms a water soluble complex with the analyte, which is in general, like I am saying complex session, it is a metal ion and of course, the titrant is often a chelating agent. Precipitation titration, precipitation. So, the titrant forms a insoluble product when it is added to the analyte. And finally, redox, reduction oxidation titration. Titration of an oxidizing agent with a reducing agent or vice versa, we call these uh, redox titration. One condition which uh, we put over here is that there should be a sufficient difference between the oxidizing and the reducing agent, uh, the capabilities, oxidizing capability and the reducing capability of these agents to undergo this kind of a titration. This is the condition we put. Now, the details of redox titrations will be discussed by Dr. Manisha Jain in the coming lecture. Thank you.